I'm Dr. Matthew Stevens, and I'd like to welcome you to the lecture series for HIH-227 and HIL-227, Medieval Britain. Uh, this module will run only in the HIL-227 history and law variant in the 2018-19 academic year. Uh, just a few words at the beginning of the module. Uh, keep in mind that HIL-227 in uh, the spring of 2019 will run as an online-only module. And so you'll need to uh, take in these lectures in your own time, and in due course, uh, quizzes will be set up uh, in parallel to that to really just keep you honest. And the lecture series as a whole is complementary to the history and law readings that you'll undertake for the seminars and the seminars as well of course will be online using blackboard collaborate i'd encourage you to uh, very carefully view the uh, information on blackboard with respect to blackboard collaborate and ensure that you do attend virtually the online seminars as they're fundamental to this course now, this lecture series will give you a good grounding in the context, the political context, and his uh, economic and social context of medieval Britain throughout uh, the period roughly 1250 to 1461, so that you have a, a, a backdrop as HIL 227 history and law students against which to understand the legal developments at the time. So I do hope that you'll take all of these lectures in uh, and try your best to get the most out of them. Uh, if you have any difficulty viewing the lectures or any of the related materials on Blackboard, do contact me. Uh, my contact details will be on the next slide. Slides, then I would ask you to uh, contact me via email. Uh, as you can see in this contact card here, MF Stevens at Swansea to AC to UK. Uh, during this semester, because this will be an online-only module, we're going to try and do everything online insofar as possible. Uh, but you are also welcome to seek me out in the department. And there are times I won't be uh, at Swansea University during the uh, course of the spring semester. But uh, if you liaise with me on email first, we can work that out and arrange meeting. Uh, note that I'm going to have online office hours during which you can contact me uh, and be assured of an immediate response. These will be on Thursdays from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, lastly, by way of this uh, basic information about the course, it's now recommended by the university, though not prescribed, uh, that I offer you what's called a trigger warning. Uh, to alert you to the fact that there are a number of themes on this module, as one might expect, of a course which covers the entire range of human experience for a period of time, uh, which you might find upsetting. This course will include uh, in-depth discussion of murder, rape, arson, famine, starvation, uh, anti-Semitism, sexism, racism, and use of historical legal terms such as bastardy. If you find these topics upsetting, you may wish to consult student support services or change module. But I would encourage you, as a mature adult at university, to grapple with these ideas uh, rather than avoiding them and try to come to a better understanding of our past through that struggle. Now, on Blackboard, you will find the module description. You'll find the learning outcomes. You'll find the lecture, week, lecture list. There are two lectures per week, and there will be one online quiz per week. You'll find referencing information there. All students are expected to submit their coursework using the MHRA referencing system. As I said, there's a guide online, but you can always email me with questions about how to cite specific sources. Your work should be submitted double-spaced uh, in 12-point Calibri font in the body of the text. Uh, there's also a document on Blackboard indicating the rules for the presentation of written work. Bibliographies for a 2,000-word essay on HIL-227. 
really should contain as a minimum uh, 10 items, uh, two or three of which ought to be primary sources. When it comes to how widely you read for preparing uh, an essay, the more you read, the better. The more primary sources, the better. If you would like to find more materials beyond uh, what you can easily identify in the library catalog or on the internet, uh, I'm always happy to point you in the direction of further reading. So to begin in earnest, uh, the first slide of this introductory lecture on medieval Britain uh, contains uh, a couple of images here of the so-called Mappa Mundi, or Map of the World in Latin. We don't know quite when this was uh, drawn. We think it was probably around the year 1290, and it's currently housed in Hereford Cathedral. Uh, you can get to Hereford on a direct, uh, on a direct train from Swansea. I'd encourage you some time if you have the uh, financial resources and uh, time available to you to travel up to Hereford, have a look at the cathedral and this map. Now this map represents a kind of symbolic uh, vision of the world in the Middle Ages. So the world is conceived of here as, as a kind of a, a two-dimensional disc and at the very center of the map uh, is Jerusalem. Uh, just here. And this is because from a theological point of view in Britain in the Middle Ages, uh, there really is only one, uh, uh, one, shall we call it, mainstream religion. There are, of course, uh, uh, localized communities of uh, Jewish persons in Britain up until the expulsion of the Jewish community in the late 13th century. But for the most part, people living in medieval Britain are Christian. And the church preferred this particular worldview, which puts Jerusalem, the center of the faith, at the center of the map. You can see the Red Sea is depicted here uh, in the color red. Uh, this is the Mediterranean in the center here. You have Europe on the left. You have North Africa over here on the right. And just at the very edge, the very edge of the known world, uh, you have the British Isles. So here, so England, uh, Wales, uh, Scotland, and Ireland squeezed just in here at the edge. But what I want to stress to you is that the period that this course covers is one during which this rather old-fashioned, uh, ecclesiastically driven view of the world is being replaced by something which is much more modern, much more attuned with what we think of today as a, a rational uh, cartographic world. So. Here are two more maps, uh, the Matthew Paris map at the left, drawn sometime between 1200 and 1259, is actually a bit older than the uh, map of Mundi. And the one on the right, the so-called Goch map, uh, is a little bit newer. And you'll see that both of these, particularly the Goch map on the right here, uh, both of these are pretty much uh, are recognizable as attempts at a realistic representation of Britain. If we look at the Matthew Paris map on the left here, you can see uh, kind of Wales here. Uh, Scotland at the top uh, is a little smaller than it ought to be, to say the least. But from someone writing in England, you can see that the focus here is on uh, uh, getting the shape of England right and indicating these waterways here in blue, which are important for uh, shipping. Of course, in the Middle Ages, as would be the case right up until modern times, it's much easier and cheaper to ship heavy goods by water than it is over land. So I'm now going to take us through a short history of England, Wales, Scotland and Ireland prior to uh, this late 13th century shift from an old view of the world, which is driven by uh, religion and, to a certain extent, uh, religiosity and imagination, and this more this emergent, more rational view of Britain, which is trying to depict the world in, in real, hard, factual, material terms. Uh, think of the contrast between the Mappa Mundi disc-type map and the Matthew Paris and uh, Goch maps. So. 
we'll start with England and we'll work through each uh, area of the British Isles and hopefully by the end of this lecture you'll have a, a kind of flavor of where the development of these uh, realms is at the uh, beginning course date for this module round about uh, 1250 1260 so England uh, England gets its name from the Angli uh, a group of people arrived uh, in the 7th century sometimes called the Anglo-Saxons uh, theoretically though we don't know for certain there were probably three Germanic groups that moved from somewhere near the base of the Danish peninsula uh, to England, what we now know as England, in the 7th century, the Angles, the Saxons, and the Utes. Uh, broadly speaking, historians call the, refer to these groups as Anglo-Saxons. They have a, a strong regnal tradition by the uh, 9th and 10th centuries of uh, having a king who is anointed by holy oil, which has been blessed uh, by a bishop or ideally by the pope. So there's a notion here of an emergent uh, kingship which is connected to the will of God. The king is the king by the will of God. Uh, also, there's a sense of a united uh, England by the 11th century. There had been, if we went all the way back to the 6th or 7th century, a series of warring kingdoms within what's now England. Uh, Wessex, uh, Northumbria, for example, just to name but two. But by the time we get to the uh, 10th, 11th century, these have coalesced under a single king anointed with holy oil. Now in 1066, the Normans invade uh, from that part of what's now France, that's called Normandy, uh, and they effectively colonize England. Because the dukes of Normandy and France, uh, under William the Conqueror, or William the Bastard, he's, he was known at the time, uh, continue to uh, hold their property in France, an empire is created which includes both conquered England and Normandy. And this eventually would expand under subsequent kings of England through marriage alliances to become what we refer to as the Angevin Empire. Uh, this is as a result of Henry, Duke of Anjou, becoming King Henry II of England in 1154. So I'm really zooming through time here. Uh, just giving you a bit of backstory. Now, these interactions are important because, first, the Anglo Saxons, with their Germanic origins, bring with them what would become the English language. And it's the linguistic shift that takes place in the 7th, 8th, 9th centuries in England that gives us the English language as distinct from the uh, Cornish. Welsh uh, or Gaelic languages that we have in Cornwall, Wales, and some parts of Scotland. Those languages, the Cornish, the Welsh language in particular, are in fact the older original languages of the British Isles, closely related, and they're supplanted by English, this primarily Germanic language that comes with the Anglo Saxons. Following the 1066 uh, Norman conquest of England, uh, the French language grows in prominence in England because French is the language spoken at the court of the Normans in Normandy. And so you have a, a kind of layered, already you have a kind of layered community within Britain where there is a old Welsh language or Brythonic language overlaid with a Germanic language and now you have an elite with a French language. During this same period, from the 7th century to the 12th century, you see rapid urban expansion, and the main cities of what would be uh, medieval Britain and England emerge, London, York, Bristol, Coventry, and Norwich. This map represents the uh, so-called Angevin Empire that was created when the Duke of Anjou became Henry II in 1154. You can see here in uh, these darker colors, I'm going around it now with the pointer, the lands that are controlled uh, by the Angevin kings of Britain. And you'll see here that it's almost a kind of mirror image with a wedge shape 
uh, area from Cornwall through England up to the Scottish border, and an opposing wedge-shaped area down here in western France. Now, these so-called Angevin kings between 1066 up to uh, the early 13th century, they really see England as almost a, a secondary territory, and they spend most of their time on the continent. England is part of a, of a cross-channel world where uh, French is dominant, uh, French culture, French song, eventually French literature is the dominant uh, culture of the ruling class in particular. And in this broad area, uh, there are attempts to unify, uh, certainly at a ruling level, the aristocracy of these two places, Anjou, uh, Normandy, in France and the realm in England. Now the ruling of, the, of England are French speaking. Latin is the language of the church and Latin is also the official language of government and administration. The use of Latin for government and administration is a, a convenience because it means whether you're an English speaker or a Welsh speaker or a French speaker you can all have a, a common language for government and administration, which is Latin. Uh, and so no matter what your first language is, if you learn Latin as your second language, you will be able to function in the administrative environment of medieval England. French, though, remains the language spoken in law courts and polite conversation. Legal records are an interesting example of cultural mixing because whilst the records themselves are written in Latin as the language of administration, we know that the language used to, to speak one's claims and counterclaims in court was in fact French. And sometimes you could see the scribes struggling to convert the French uh, language used in court into the Latin language of official records. We call this society Anglo-Norman society. Uh, because it mixes the, the, the cultural, social, political world of the Angli in England and the Normans uh, in northern France. But this would all come to an end, more or less, in 1204, when the King of France overruns territory uh, that belongs to the King of England, poor bad King John, as we know him now, taking away Normandy, uh, and most of Anjou. All that remains to the English crown after 1204 is Gascony, an area in the west of France, which would eventually emerge as an important wine growing region, and the so called Channel Islands. Now, after the kings of England lose their French territories, for the first time ever, uh, these Anglo Norman kings of England really have to double down and focus on developing their realm in England uh, because they have nothing else left to them really. And there are great strides made in the early 13th century. The uh, administration is centralized through the creation of common law courts uh, centrally located in uh, at Westminster near London. Uh, the so-called Inns of Court for the training of lawyers emerge there. Royal justices are created. These are head judges to travel the land, uh, hearing lawsuits as well. Parliament, as we know it now, begins to sit uh, in different places, but very often at Westminster from 1236. Uh, and really, by the time we reach the reign of King Henry III, who would die in 1272, we have a really centralized state, which has become unified in terms of governance, uh, uh, legal system, and in tax collection as well, uh, to a level beyond most other places in Western Europe. When King Henry III of England faces an uprising against his barons, his own barons, uh, in the mid 13th century, this is as a result, really, of what uh, today might be termed uh, governmental overreach. You know, the uh, 
Barons of England feel as though they've reached kind of saturation point with the centralization of government, uh, and Henry has to fight a long conflict with his own barons, uh, which eventually ends at the Battle of Evesham, at which his son, Prince Edward, the man who had become Edward I of England, uh, defeats Henry's enemies, leading to an even further, stronger centralization of English administration, law, and tax collection. So we're going to take a step back now, and I'm going to run you through this same narrative of uh, early history up to the mid-13th century, this time with respect to Scotland. And I want you to note the geography of the British Isles here. If you look at the map on the left, you'll see these dark areas here uh, in tans and browns are generally those which are over 600 feet. Now that, dis that uh, uh, line of topography of 600 feet is incredibly important because in the Middle Ages, if you wanted to get rich, you did so by growing grain, particularly wheat, if not wheat, then oats. And 600 feet is the maximum elevation at which you can grow wheat or oats in a typical year in the Middle Ages. And so if you look at England, you can see that most all of England, apart from the, the Peak District in the northeast up here, Cumbria, most of England uh, is pretty much under 600 feet, suitable for agriculture, and that is, excuse me, that is also to say, suitable for the generation of wealth through farming. If you look at, at Scotland in particular, but also Wales down here and Ireland you will see the situation there is very different. Scotland has a very limited amount of space on which you can grow grain, the main cash crop in the Middle Ages. Uh, it also lacks, apart from the Scottish lowlands just here, it, it lacks uh, a large uh, lowland arable plain. If you look on the right here, you can see uh, the borders of Scotland more or less as they were in the Middle Ages. It's worth knowing that the Scottish border at one time came a bit further south here down to about Berwick-on-Tweed. Uh, but that's something that would change uh, in the period covered by our course. Uh, Scotland, or the uh, country of the Scots, uh, begins to emerge from the uh, 7th or 8th century, although the roots are very murky to say the least. Uh, there was at one time a kingdom called the Kingdom of Dalreada, which encompassed both uh, northeast Ireland, uh, today what we think was northern Ireland, uh, and southwest Scotland. And that kingdom uh, had a very distinct Gaelic tradition and a lot of shared institutions, in including a, a notion of this institution of kingship. That slowly takes root uh, in uh, southwest uh, Scotland and eventually lowland Scotland in the same way that uh, Angles, Saxons and Jutes have from uh, areas near to the base of the Danish Peninsula had colonized England, eventually giving it its, its English language. There is also a uh, ingress of these Germanic peoples into lowland areas of Scotland. Uh, there they would uh, give rise to what we think of today is the, the Scots language, which is, I would be very careful I phrase this here, it's, it's not exactly a variant of Old English, but it has German, uh, Germanic influences in much the same way, and Scots is mutually intelligible to English in the Middle Ages, uh, as, in, as indeed modern Scots is intelligible to English uh, speakers today. Uh, this only serves to underlie uh, the way in which there, excuse me, underline the way in which there is mixture of peoples in medieval Scotland. So there are these these uh, uh, Celts in south, uh, in west, southwest Scotland, who have a tradition of kingship, uh, which comes from this old kingdom of Dalriada, which uh, spanned northern Ireland, southwest Scotland. There are also these uh, incoming. Uh, Germanic persons, these Angles. Additionally, there is a much older group called, called the 
Picts, an ethnic group which have existed in uh, Highland uh, and parts of Eastern Scotland since Roman times. And there are also Norse persons, which are the uh, descendants of immigrants who came together with Viking raiders from uh, what are today Norway, Sweden, Denmark, uh, and possibly some even as far afield as what's now Finland. So these Picts, Celts, Norse, and Angles together form into a community which is a recognizable kingdom uh, by the, uh, well, certainly by the 12th century. And really in the late 12th and early 13th century, these groups start to coalesce into uh, a, a uh, fairly sophisticated uh, political entity. Uh, following a, a long series of, of uh, Scottish kings that have control over more or less of the country, uh, Alexander II emerges as a, a, a unifying and stabilizing force to a certain degree, the early 13th century, ruling from 1214 to 49. And Alexander II's long reign helps very much to create a, a more secure and enduring uh, form of Scottish kingship. Among other things, uh, he uh, agrees with England, the Treaty of York, 1237, a, a, firm, uh, a firm border between Scotland and England, uh, reducing the amount of uh, uh, raiding and uh, warfare uh, along the southern edge of the realm of Scotland. Uh, not long after, uh, in 1266, the uh, subsequent King of Scotland manages to defeat uh, Meg, King Magnus of Norway, Magnus IV, I believe it is, uh, and at the Battle of Largs, which took place in 1263, and then in 1266, the King of the Scots and the King of Norway uh, agreed the Treaty of Perth, which gives the Outer Hebrides and the uh, Isles uh, politically uh, cedes control to the King of Scotland. And it's at this point that, that the realm of Scotland really comes together uh, with the exception of uh, Shetland and Orkney, which would remain in Norse control uh, for some time to come. Now, despite these these kind of these advances, the sort of growth of a sense of central kingship, the, the uh, increasing uh, capacity of these different ethnic groups in Scotland to work together, despite the unifying efforts of Alexander II, uh, the Treaty of York, the establishment of control over the islands of the Treaty of Perth. Despite all these things, Scotland nevertheless remains far less centralized than England. There are no central law courts. The administration of law is devolved out to various barons. Uh, the Scottish kings mint uh, money, but there's certainly a, they mint a lot less of it than English kings, and English money circulates freely north of the border. Uh, Scotland it is a kingdom in the early to mid 13th century, but it is a kingdom that has relatively shallow roots and is uh, still finding its feet as a central political entity. As, re as a consequence, the economy of Scotland is weaker than the economy of England. Uh, important towns do emerge. Aberdeen and Dundee, uh, Edinburgh and Stirling are of particular uh, importance. But whereas uh, London, for example, may have been 70, 80, or 90,000 people in the 13th century. Uh, Aberdeen, Dundee, Edinburgh, Stirling, uh, none of these really extends beyond uh, a few thousand people at the most. The kings of Scotland, as I, men I think I mentioned earlier, uh, do fall prey to the lure of French culture in the same way that uh, uh, French culture has permeated English society on the back of Anglo-Norman uh, conquest, or at the back of Norman conquest, uh, it slowly seeps north of the border. When you have a ruling elite in neighboring England, which is French speaking and takes pride in uh, the promotion of French uh, language, literature, and culture, and you want to intermar intermarry with that uh, English aristocracy you know, to create a, a solid, unified political alliance uh, that can stabilize the Anglo-Scottish border, then, of course, you have French aristocracy moving into uh, the Scottish, uh, Scottish noble 
uh, circles. Walter of Coventry is able to say, or feels he can say confidently in the 13th century, the most recent Scottish kings count themselves Frenchmen by race, manners, habits, speech. I don't think the kings of Scotland woke up in the morning and said, actually, I'm a Frenchman. But I do think that it's fair to say that uh, in the same way that in Napoleonic times, the, the political and cultural dominance of French meant that uh, French was the language of polite conversation on an international uh, level. I think that that's also true, certainly, of this broad area which extends across France, England and Scotland uh, in the 13th century. Gaelic culture does still survive. Uh, the stone of destiny at Schoon uh, remains the place where Scottish kings are crowned, and it had remained the place where Scottish kings were crowned uh, from some point back, or oh, I think in the 7th or 8th century. Uh, you know, there are some very strongly Gaelic, specifically Gaelic, undercurrents of culture. Uh, continuing in Scotland and also particularly in the Western Isles which had come into the realm of the Scottish King uh, following the Treaty of Perth in 1266 Norse culture and Norse language uh, remained very strong. If we turn to Wales now uh, where we are at present of course we can see that Wales suffers some of the same uh, geographical disadvantages as Scotland Again, note here these in this left image, these brown or tan areas are areas over 600 feet, uh, the elevation beyond which you cannot grow grain, the made foodstuff and cash crop in the Middle Ages. This means that even more so than Scotland, Welsh population is distributed around Wales, particularly on the coastal plain. We can see these dark uh, green areas or hard on the border with England. Wales, uh, maybe the, by comparison with Scotland, the low, lowland belt of southern Scotland uh, isn't a convenient uh, social and political gathering place for all Scots, but at least there is a central lowland belt, uh, even if it is weighted towards the south of Scotland. Uh, in Wales, there is no equivalent really population is distributed widely around the fringes of Wales in the Middle Ages. Now this distribution of population around the edges of Wales has implications for the uh, formation of a uh, monarchy or state in Wales which would echo through the Middle Ages. Uh, Wales is a place which is occupied by the ancient uh, Britons. These are the people who uh, resided in the in the British Isles prior to the arrival of the Romans back in the days of the Roman Empire. As I mentioned with respect to England in the uh, 6th or 7th century, these Germanic speaking peoples, the Anglo, Angles, Saxons and Utes, move in in substantial numbers and colonize England to the extent that the dominant language of England becomes English, what would emerge as English. But that invasion and colonization only went as far as the Cumbrian Mountains. And so Wales remains uh, almost a, a, a kind of fossilized part of Britain where the uh, culture and language of the ancient Britons uh, can remain dominant. Uh, Cymru, of course, is a word for Welsh uh, in the Welsh language, which in older forms of Welsh has meaning meaning something closer along the lines of of one blood. Uh, the word Welsh, of course, is itself an Anglo-Saxon word, which means foreign. And so, in effect, uh, in the eyes of these uh, uh, mixed uh, Anglo-Saxon people who colonize England, make England their home, and give England uh, the, the roots of its current language, they view these, these people to the west of the Cumbrian Mountains as, as different, as four. Wales, as I mentioned, lacks geographical unity. It's also fragmented politically. Uh, in the north of Wales, we have uh, the Kingdom of Gwynedd in the northwest, focused on Anglesey, a powys in central Wales, uh, really 
covering an area that at one time included the lowlands around Shrewsbury and extended uh, west uh, as far as the mountains. Uh, and then in South Wales, of course, we have uh, the Old Welsh Kingdom of De Haybarth in the southwest, which in incorporated Pembrokeshire for the most part, uh, an Old Welsh Kingdom uh, focused in what is now Glamorgan that was called Morganog. Now, I put on this slide here only Gwynedd and Powys because by the time we reach the 13th century, these are the two uh, surviving, the two strong surviving uh, Welsh uh, kingdoms. The kingdom of De Haybarth is hanging on to a certain extent uh, in the southwest, uh, but really uh, Gwynedd and Powys become the, the kind of leaders uh, by the 13th century. Now, Norman conquest in England uh, in 1066 doesn't have much of an immediate effect on Wales. Uh, those nasty French-speaking Normans stay for the most part east of the border, uh, but very slowly, uh, as early as 1067, they start chipping away at borderlands with Wales, where they see a little bit of real estate that's not in the realm of England, uh, but yet is close enough they can use England as a jumping off point to conquer little territory for themselves. When one of these uh, French-speaking uh, Norman aristocrats takes a little piece of Wales, he keeps it for himself. It does not become part of England. And so as uh, years and eventually centuries pass by, uh, Norman and eventually even some English barons keep uh, biting off little parcels of land in Wales, each of which becomes what we call a marcher lordship almost a micro-kingdom unto itself. Now, the, the Welsh uh, nobility, the Welsh princes, as they call themselves in Gwynedd, Powys, to a certain extent, Haybarth in the southwest, uh, uh, engage in a, a long rearguard action against these incomers. And it's only in the 13th century that the princes of Gwynedd uh, really begin to pull together uh, and form something that looks like, it looks like the nucleus of an emergent uh, state or realm. First, under Llywodan Vawr, Llywodan the Great, and then under his uh, descendant, Llywodan ap Gruffith. Llywodan ap Gruffith in the 13th century manages, at a time when the English uh, monarchy is in turmoil uh, to wrest from the English king Henry III the Treaty of Montgomery in 1267, uh, which creates for the first time a unified quote unquote principality of Wales uh, as a constitutional entity. You might recall that I mentioned when speaking about England that under Henry III there is the so called Barons' War. Uh, in the 1260s, which is almost a kind of pushback by the barons against the rapid growing centralization of the English state. And it's in the context of that barons' war and the turmoil in England that, that Llewellyn manages to get this Treaty of Montgomery uh, to create a principality of Wales as a constitutional entity. But, but there's a catch. Uh, in fact, in this case, there are two catches. Number one, the so-called Principality of Wales only included the 40 or 50 percent uh, of Wales which was still in native hands as of 1267. It did not in incorporate all of Wales. Uh, for the most part it incorporated uh, Gwynedd, uh, Powys in northwest, uh, east central, parts of Wales, and also uh, De Haybarth, those little bits of the Kingdom of De Haybarth hanging on in southwest Wales uh, in Ceredigion down into Pembrokeshire. This map gives you an indication in, in 1234, uh, under, during the, the reign of uh, Thorin Vaur, Thorin the Great, uh, progenitor of Thorin Ap Gruffith, 
where the native control of Wales ended, uh, and that's just here along the line, what, what, what's written in Latin here is pure Walia, or pure Wales, that is native controlled Wales. And you can see here in uh, tan and dark blue here, those lands which are controlled uh, by marcher lords. These are the so-called lordships, those pieces I was talking about that were hived off one little piece at a time from native control and turned into effectively micro kingdoms that were neither under the control of Welsh princes nor were they part of the English realm. And these uh, marches of Wales, these marcher lordships, remain a kind of wild card in uh, politics of the British Isles uh, for centuries to come. When in 1267, Florin ap sometimes called Florin the Last, uh, would acquire the uh, Treaty of Montgomery from the English king, uh, the boundaries of the Principality of Wales are more or less uh, follow the boundaries of Pure Walia, as labelled here. Wales uh, had no unified political structures. They have a, a strong cultural identity, uh, but no clear uh, unified political structures. Even in 1267, with the creation of the Treaty of Montgomery, even in 1267, all that treaty did really was to give uh, a right of dominance over the other parts of native controlled Wales to the princes of Gwynedd. It did not set out anything equivalent to an outline for a parliament or an outline for a system of taxation or an outline for any other uh, clear aspect of governance. But really all it did was rubber stamp the right of the princes of Gwynedd to demand the allegiance of the other native rulers of Wales. That is to demand that they bend the knee in uh, Game of Thrones terms. Now, despite this, compared to Scotland uh, or indeed England, Wales has a much stronger cultural identity because Wales, native Wales, effectively is uh, a single ethnic group. This older population from the British Isles from way back before the 1066 Norman conquest, before the 7th century coming of the Germanic, Anglo-Saxons and Jutes, all the way back to Roman times. They had always been there. Uh, as I mentioned before, Cymru is variously interpreted earlier Welsh versions of Cymru as people of one region or people of one blood. And that really says, says it all. Uh, there is a so-called law of Yorda, uh, which is a collection of laws attributed to the uh, 10th century King Hyo uh, how the good, how the, uh, but probably actually assembled by various uh, uh, various judges or lawyers who moved around Wales really with a free hand as independent uh, independent adjudicators that you could hire to come in and resolve a case for you. But this law of your is is recognised pretty much universally by the native peoples of Wales as uh, embodying their cultural traditions of law. And their customs of Wales, uh, particular land measurements, uh, particular systems for leasing property, uh, for uh, particular systems for inheritance, and of course a particular language, you know, the Welsh language itself. Uh, Welsh is a, a written language uh, from the early Middle Ages. You know, uh, Law and literature is written down in the Welsh language really at a time as early as or even before the English language. And so whilst Wales lacks political unity, it, it very much has a cultural unity that is absent from England or Scotland. And this brings us to the last part of the British Isles and our, our tour here, uh, that being Ireland. Again, I draw attention to uh, the reasonably substantial parts of Ireland that are in brown here, those that are too, uh, at too high an elevation for the growing of grain, for the growing cash crops. Ireland does have a reasonably substantial lowland uh, central area. And so one might expect 
that that would have aided in the creation of a unified uh, a unified Ireland. Uh, but that would not be the case, unfortunately. In the 6th century, there are a multiplicity of, of provincial rulers, uh, most all of which refer to themselves as king. Uh, generationally, uh, kings are chosen from the pool of males within four generations of the last king. So that is to say, uh, if you have a king and there are an entire pool 20 or 30 years later of great grandsons of that king, any one of which might assert a claim to be king over the same ancestral area. And they determine who actually becomes king pretty much by killing each other until someone emerges as the most powerful. Uh, obviously, that, that's a very chaotic way of uh, governing. Ireland remains uh, uh, in, in the grip of this kind of uh, generational uh, conflict for control of different parts of Ireland uh, up until the 12th century. A concept had emerged in Ireland of a so-called High King of Ireland, but in effect, no one is ever really strong enough uh, to occupy that position uh, to the exclusion of other claimants at any one time. And so, whilst in reality there are all these uh, uh, warring factions within Ireland uh, who war within themselves for control of any given Irish kingdom, and then those kingdoms war between one another for uh, the right to be the High King of Ireland, the reality is the, the office of High King of Ireland remains more or less one uh, that is rooted in concept but not in practice. This is the state of Ireland uh, when in the 1060s uh, adventures the Earl of uh, Pembroke, so-called Strongbow, uh, adventurers arrive from their territories uh, in southwest uh, southwest. Anglo-Norman marcher Wales, I hope those terms mean something to you now, uh, and land in southeast Ireland. Uh, really, uh, the story here is one that we'll come back to in greater depth when we have the lecture on Ireland, but an, a, a dispossessed Irish prince turns up in Pembrokeshire, which by the mid-12th century is a, 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 an established Anglo-Norman marcher lordship, where these territories has been uh, carved out of Wales that is now under Anglo-Norman control. And this chap says, why, well, if you'll come back to Ireland and help me uh, regain my uh, crown, then I will uh, give you various rewards. I'll allow you to marry in the family and so forth. Now, I think what, the, uh, what this fellow didn't quite realize is that uh, whereas there had been a long tradition of shifting alliances within Ireland and even alliances in which uh, Irish and Welsh moved back and forth across the Irish Sea to help one another in uh, various local disputes for control, that those disputes generally resolved themselves with uh, a local person back in control. They are almost not quite mercenary, but they're, they're very short-lived alliances. Whereas when this alliance was struck up uh, with uh, the Earl of Pembroke, called, of course we call Strongbow now, and the fullest history, that that would uh, be viewed by a Norman as carte blanche to come conquer and keep indefinitely uh, lands in Ireland. In fact, uh, the initial invasion from Pembrokeshire uh, to Southeast Ireland it is so successful that the King of England would follow in 1171 for fear of being shut out uh, of a good opportunity to conquer lands uh, in Ireland. And there's substantial uh, immigrant settlement in Ireland. Uh, and these are, tend to be peasant farmers who are recruited from England and recruited from parts of Southwest Wales. Uh, where there's already been disruption due to Anglo-Norman uh, conquest of marcher lordships. And these, these peasants settle in the, uh, 
the best lowland agricultural districts on the central east uh, area of Ireland. Ireland then becomes a land of two people, a land of two peoples, excuse me. Dublin and Cork are very uh, firmly in English hands, and around each there is a, uh, a, a substantial and growing area of uh, English or Anglo-Norman control, that is to say, uh, barons who have ancestry in Normandy and speak uh, French, and also some barons who simply are powerful English barons who get in on the act. Uh, and they keep those lowland districts around Cork and Dublin under a form of what we now might call colonial administration, but very much under a form of English style administrative control. On the other hand, areas outside uh, of the so-called uh, pale of English control remain in native Irish hands and a number of native Irish uh, kings and chieftains remain uh, out there both battling with one another and battling against the incoming uh, English. Now it's it's important uh, particularly uh, it's important particularly from the views of the aristocracy uh, that they uh, look to be doing something more than simply conquering for the sake of conquering uh, in the eyes of the church. And so a case is made, very much a, a case is made to the church by these powerful Anglo-Norman lords uh, that effectively the laws, and I quote you here from a, uh, uh, I quote you here from a contemporary document, the laws the Irish use are detestable to God and contrary to all law so much that they ought not be deemed law. And in fact, uh, there are appeals made to the Pope to justify and sanctify the Anglo-Norman invasion of Ireland on the grounds that they are uh, bringing these sort of backward Irish people up to speed with proper Christian practice. Now I give you here a map uh, which indicates around about 1300 what parts of Ireland are in uh, Norman or Anglo-Norman control and what parts of Ireland are in native Irish control and you'll see really here uh, this map I think rather generously puts in dark blue as English controlled most of lowland Ireland. Uh, in reality I think particularly out here in the west uh, a lot of these areas are only superficially or temporarily in English control. And during the course of the 14th century, as we'll, we'll cover eventually, uh, well, I think in one or two lectures time, the area of English control would shrink uh, really pretty dramatically uh, given the uh, lack of attention paid to Irish holdings by Anglo-Norman lords and indeed the English crown. Uh, we have a, a situation in Ireland which ultimately is a little different from the situation in Wales. Keep in mind how in Wales, when pieces of property were taken from the native Welsh uh, nobility, they became almost independent uh, micro-kingdoms that we call marcher lordships, whereas the participation of the king in the conquest of Ireland from 1171 guarantees that Ireland becomes uh, what is called in English administrative records, the lordship of Ireland. That is to say, the king asserts that in Ireland, unlike in the March of Wales, the king has the final say. Uh, uh, Dublin, of course, we are Dublin right here under the, the marker, uh, is a royal uh, city, and there is a, a royal government there, which has a, eventually would have a, a parliament, an Irish parliament, uh, and Irish judge, Irish judiciary, colonial judiciary, administering Ireland in a way that looks a little bit uh, like a pale reflection of English administration. Uh, Ireland and the Irish uh, are a very interesting uh, topic. Uh, customs in Ireland are, are more agricultural and pastoral. Uh, Ireland is not an urbanized place and I should point out that in uh, if I bring us back to Wales for a moment, the, the Wales effectively lacked towns before the coming of the English. 
Uh, in Ireland, there were some towns uh, such as Dublin, uh, but in fact, they had uh, Norse uh, or Viking roots uh, more so than Irish roots. Uh, Viking traders had come to Ireland and there was in fact quite a substantial uh, Hiberno-Norse, uh, that is to say, uh, Norse-Irish community in and around Dublin in particular. Uh, Irish, uh, the Irish soil, and again, I, I give you a contemporary quote here. I think this is from Gerard of Wales, if I remember correctly. Irish soil is so poor that it can only sustain a rustic and beggarly crowd of Irishmen outside the cities. But Englishmen and Frenchmen, having a more civilized way of life, dwell in cities and are familiar with trade and commerce. Uh, this is a bit of kind of intensely unfair uh, ethnographic writing here. In fact, the, the soil in Ireland, uh, uh, yes, it may be poorer than in lowland England, but it's not unsuitable for the growing of grains. You uh, might recall from the map I showed you a moment ago how much of Ireland is, is actually below that uh, important 600-foot line. But Ireland does see substantially more rain than uh, particularly southeast England, uh, and it is harder, harder uh, to get wealthy through the cultivation of grains in Ireland. Uh, and again, this this here is a comment on the, the sort of smaller role played by urban life in Ireland uh, by the 13th century when this is being written. Uh, but at the same time, it kind of overemphasizes uh, the case. This is part of the problem of looking at Ireland uh, or Wales to a certain extent, is it because the so much of what we uh, have about the early history of these places in eyewitness accounts uh, is written from the point of view of the outsider, oftentimes from a very uh, strongly negative outside point of view, it, it becomes hard to uh, determine, it becomes hard to determine uh, what's true and what's not true. And one thinks that uh, very often uh, the Irish and the Welsh are not given uh, fair treatment in the eyes of contemporary writers. Uh, I put here Christianity Celtic because uh, it's worth noting that uh, uh, there is a, a distinct form of Christianity which exists in Ireland. Uh, whilst after the uh, Roman Empire, the British Isles had uh, more or less, even in those areas conquered by the Romans, uh, become unchristian in the sense that they had reverted to other uh, traditional beliefs, Ireland actually Christianizes quite strongly before England uh, and arguably before Wales. And so there is a, a very old uh, uh, Dark Age Christian tradition in Ireland which has slightly different usages. For example, a different way of calculating the date of Easter, uh, which as you know is A, most, the most important holiday in the Christian calendar, but B, is a movable feast uh, calculated against cycles of the moon. Uh, and it's this difference between what we might call mainstream Christian practice in the 12th century and Celtic Irish Christian practice that is one of the justifications uh, for invading uh, Ireland to put right their quote unquote backward ways. Uh, the Irish language comes to be seen eventually after a period of conflict as the language of the enemies of the king. So what can we say about medieval Britain as a whole? Well, uh, England and Scotland are independent uh, kingdoms and they're both increasingly centralized and focused on a single king, although England is uh, considerably ahead in terms of economic development, uh, centralization, uh, uh, and eco uh, excuse me, economic development, centralization, uh, and judicial development. Wales and Ireland are half conquered territories with no one central authority and no unified uh, political structures. Uh, but Wales and Ireland are more culturally unified. The Irish, like the Welsh, have uh, a single language, a single set of, of cultural practices. And just as there is the so-called law of Yul Tha, uh, the single system of law generally recognized by all native Welsh persons, there is the so-called Brehan law uh, in Ireland. To the right of this slide, you'll see a manuscript drawing made at the end of the 13th to very early 14th century. And you'll see in it the King of England seated centrally here 
above the Prince of Wales and King of Scotland. Below him on this checkered floor down here are various uh, barons, prelates, so forth of England. And this is the world view that the English are trying to project and propagate by the middle of the 13th century. England is acknowledged in treaties as having the allegiance of the King of Scotland, the Princes of Wales, and where they can arrange it, the various chieftains of Ireland. England has an economic dominance over the other parts of the British Isles. And in terms of the culture, the economic institutions, judicial institutions, and the degree of centralization that has been achieved in England, it is a dominant force projecting itself both actively through conquest and passively uh, when other barons uh, copy the English, it's projecting itself throughout the British Isles. By 1250, there is stability and security more or less in the realm of the English king. Whilst Wales and Ireland may be part conquered places, they are places in which there is a recognisable status quo by that point, and there is a, a recognisable reasonably stable diplomatic relationship between England and Scotland. Now this would all change by the end of the 13th and early 14th century. By 1307 you would have Edward I, King of England, uh, sometimes called Edward the Great or Edward Longshanks, referring to himself as King of England, Wales and Scotland and Lord of Ireland. Because something dramatic happens in that window between 1250 and 1307 that is the conquest of the remainder of native Wales by the English king and the invasion of Scotland by the English king. What Rhys Davies has called uh, the attempted creation of a first English empire. And it's that important phase, that shift from a circa 1250 status quo to a, an emergent uh, aggressive assertion of English dominance by the end of the 13th century that we're going to cover in the next few lectures.